entering Juan Pea's has done really has done some really influential work on quantum aspects of near term and extremal black holes. And I guess he'll tell us about some of that today. Um, looking at near single black holes from far away. So please take it away. Yeah. yeah, thank you very much for the invitation. Uh, it's my first time here and looks like a nice place. Um, yeah, so we're talking about <clears throat> um, near extremal black holes. So we can Okay, and the plan of the talk is the following. First, I will describe some puzzles that arise in the near extremal limit of black holes and the resolution. And this part of the talk, I will try to make uh, as, as general as, as possible without going into too much detail. So hopefully it um, doesn't get too technical. Then in the last part of the talk, I will describe some upcoming work with a great uh, postdoc from UCSB, Maciej Kolanowski, uh, Don Marl, William Rakic, uh, student at UC Davis, and Mugun Ragamani. But hopefully, I was hoping it will appear already, but okay, it's probably taking a week or so. <laughs> hopefully. Okay, so let me start by reminding you what extremal black holes are. Um, as seen from the, black, uh, from the outside, you'll know that black holes geometries are characterized by only a few parameters, such as the mass, the angular momentum, and the charge. For fixed charges, solutions without negative singularities have to satisfy uh, this lower bound on their mass, which there is a general expression for arbitrary j's and, and q's, but to, just to simplify it, I'm reminding you how it looks for, for non-rotating black holes and for uncharged black holes. So this would be a, a, the lower bound on the mass for a curved black hole, and this for a right Nordstrom. So if the mass is bigger than this value, the black hole is the similarities are behind horizons, and if you're below this bound, then you can make it singularities. And a black hole with the minimal value of this mass saturates it, is called extremal. <clears throat> okay, so what is special about the extremal limit of black holes? So generically, for generical values of, of the parameters, the black hole only have essentially two isometries, time translations are rotations around the uh, direction of the angular momentum. Uh, but near extremality, when we are close to saturating this bound, the geometry close to the horizon becomes, uh, well, develops an ADS2 factor, a two dimensional anti sitter factor times the S2 that represents the angular directions transverse to uh, the temporal and radial direction. And a new powerful symmetry emerges that is conformal invariance, which comes from the isometries of the ADS2 factor. And something that was, well, known for a long time, but really, I think, Properly understood in the last maybe let's say 10 years or so, is that the dynamics of near extremal black holes is controlled by the breaking of this conformal invariance um, due to the finite temperature. Or, well, when you're a little bit away from extremality, this symmetry is approximate and the dynamics is controlled by the breaking of this symmetry. Um, examples of quantities that are controlled by this are the, the spectrum, the I mean, the black hole spectrum, the spectrum of quasi normal modes, the temperature dependence of the heat capacity, among others. And we will see some of those during the talk. Just to remind you, the geometry of the near field black hole looks like this. So we have this ADS2 throw that I just mentioned. And finite temperature, this, this, the isometries of ADS2 are approximate because you need to glue it to the asymptotically flat four dimensional space uh, where the black hole is embedded. And so this is a spatial slice, and this is just to remind you the Fernos diagram. So these throws will cover the whole the central portion of the of the diagram, and once you go far away from the horizon, bounded by this blue line, then the, this, this ADS2 approximation will break down. So this is familiar result for Wright and Nordstrom, and uh, it's also true for Kerr and Kerr-Newman, as was found by Bartina and Horowitz, where, well, here I'm saying ADS2 versus two, of course, if you have a gram momentum, there is some vibration, but um, <clears throat> that you need to take into account. Okay, so, and the, the point of this talk is that we will study extremal black holes in the context of holography, which is essentially a conjecture that says that black holes behave as ordinary quantum systems as seen from the outside. Um, this is a nice picture um, of, a, of a throat and a quantum system that is supposed to be described as a black hole. Oh, yeah. uh, for what I was saying, not really. I guess that's how. Just phrasing it the way. There are ordinary quantum systems also seem to be 
maybe I don't want to get into what happens if you jump into the black hole. That's kind of away from. But yeah, I agree. But what I would say today that might not black be. Black hole or ordinary quantum Yeah. Um, well, okay. Okay, well, you could ask whether experimentally that falls into the black hole will still see the unitary evolution of quantum mechanics being true or not. But okay, I don't think that. No. we can discuss about that later. <laughs> um, okay, um, in this context, uh, extreme of black holes would describe the ground states. So, in the center of peak charge, this is the lower bound, bound on the mass, which is the energy um, of the black hole. So the extreme limit would be the, the ground state of this black hole quantum system. And indeed, at the extremity, the Hawking temperature of the black hole vanishes. Um, and in this talk, we'll be interested in the near extrema regime, which corresponds to temperatures much smaller than roughly the, the size of the black hole. Here, A is the area of the event horizon. Um, let me describe the first puzzle. It's a violation of the term of thermodynamics. So similar black holes have zero temperature, but a finite area horizon. Um, and this implies that if you compute the Wittgenstein Hawking entropy, which is proportional to the area of the event horizon in, in Planck units, um, the Wittgenstein Hawking entropy at extremality becomes the area of the event horizon at extremality in Planck units, which uh, depends on the charges in, in this way. It's non vanishing and, and very large. So the black hole quantum system, if, ex if it exists, it will have a ridiculously large degeneracy of its ground states, given by the exponential of this um, extreme entropy. And I could say that this violates the third law of thermodynamics. And this is the one that says that the entropy should vanish at zero temperature. This is different than another version of the third law that was also discussed uh, in the past, especially was proven by Israel and recently disproven by other groups. Um, this, this is this, I, I think it's called the Planck versions of the third law. Uh, but this is mostly a phenomenological expectation. So, an interacting quantum system is not expected to have such a large degeneracy without any symmetry principle behind it. <clears throat> so, for example, you could consider a gas of interacting particles that have a, a spin, and maybe the interaction doesn't de depend on the spin. So the gas state could be a large degeneracy, could have a large degeneracy, but that's because you have this. This extra uh, conserved quantity, that number of conserved quantities. Okay. So <clears throat> this is a problem because there is evidence, which which maybe would be the topic of a different talk, that the black hole system is chaotic, and not only chaotic, but it's maximally chaotic in some sense. Um, so there is no indication of any, yeah, of any symmetry principle protecting this large ground state degeneracy. There are two options out of this puzzle. The first option is that maybe I shouldn't push the notion that black holes are quantum system. This might be true, who knows? Uh, but this is against all the at least theoretical evidence from string theory, which is essentially a theory that gives you pairs of black holes and, and quantum systems, and we've been discussed, this duality has been checked for decades. Um, but okay, I just like to keep it in mind as an option, of course. But is it, isn't there another option involving um, supersymmetry? Uh, I will mention that later. Um, but the, the classical prediction could be right when there's supersymmetry. Oh, yeah. with no symmetry principle behind it. But there could be a symmetry. There could be. Yeah, yeah. If you have if you have a symmetry principle, then you're. Yeah. If you have a reason to expect such a weird feature, then that's okay. Then there's no yeah. puzzle. Yeah. And I'll, I'll, discuss, I'll discuss that in, in a few minutes. Yeah. But, I but, to, but yes. why do you think classical gravity predicts that? Because, of course, we would expect it to be corrected by quantum effects. Yeah, so that's option. Uh, Large yeah. corrections. Yeah, yeah. Classical, but they're small. They only shift the energy levels a little bit, right? Uh, in general, yes, but not in the extremal limit. That's the important point. So we will find quantum corrections that at extremality become large. That's what I meant by option two. So in, in, yeah, so the option two is that there are large quantum corrections, there are large corrections to the classical analysis that gives us this Bekenstein Hawking entropy. But they don't they don't shift the energy to the energies by a large amount, they just uh, make small splitting. 
they shift the density. For example, if you compute the free energy, they do uh, they have a large effect on the free energy with, from which you can extract the, the entropy in, in your space. But, but that's the okay. That's the point of, of the next slide. So maybe you can ask me. I mean the the microstate energies only have a small shift. But the lots of energy is large. Where the class there's some classical degeneracy which is lifted by quantum effects. It's not yeah it, it, yeah yeah. Maybe the surprising thing here is that um, let's say if you take the charges of the black hole to be very large, you could have an extremal geometry where all the let's say curvatures are small. You would think that. Classical gravity would be a good approximation of the small corrections, and yet there are some quantum effects that uh, become unexpectedly large in the extremal limit. So, what's the unexpected that I'm wondering? I mean, is the hyperfine splitting in the hydra is that a large correction to the Bohr? You know, yeah. um, but yeah. I mean, from the point of view of the quantum system described in the black hole, this is not surprising. The, what I wanted to emphasize is how to see it from gravity. So, um, yeah, so maybe this will become more clear as we, as we go on. Um, but yeah, so option one, we should interpret the black classic quantum system. Option two, there are large corrections to the classical analysis that, that we, we forgot about. So let me describe the the second puzzle, which is the breakdown of statistical description of black holes. This one was raised a long time ago by Fred Steele Schwartz, Shapir, Ibedi, and Wilczek in 1991. So I realize maybe it's a little small, but they say that we argue that the description of a black hole as a statistical object must break down at the extreme as the extreme limit is approached due to uncontrollable thermodynamic fluctuations. So they find problems in the classical thermodynamics of black holes even before you reach extremality at some small but finite temperatures. Um, um, and well, there, there have been other papers, uh, partly by, by Terminger, um, emphasizing this puzzle afterwards. So let me tell you what it is. <clears throat> so the thermal film of black holes is appropriate if the emission of a typical quantum of radiation does not change the temperature by a substantial amount. Um, and what these authors realized was that this property is close, close enough to extremality. So the temperature change upon the emission of the Hawking quanta can be computed in this way. So it's the, the derivative of the temperature with respect to the mass times the change in the mass of the black hole, which is the energy of the Hawking quanta, which is expected to be a order of the, of the temperature itself. Um, <clears throat> if we compute this, this combination, we find an answer that at zero temperature is non-vanishing. It's this this quality that I wrote here that I call the, the breakdown scale. Um, so the statistical description of the black hole will break down when the black hole is colder than, than this scale, because then the fluctuations in the temperature will become larger than the temperature itself. Okay. Um, so let me, just to give you an idea, if you look at, at this expression for this breakdown temperature, this is extremely small, of course. So the, the first term, this H bar over GNM, this is roughly the Hawking temperature of uh, that the Schwarzschild black hole with the same mass would have. That's already for human scales very small. But this breakdown scale is further uh, suppressed by a factor of the um, of the extremal entropy. So if the well, it's just to emphasize that if you thought that the Hawking temperature was small, this is even much more. Um, Okay, but importantly, this, and this will be important later, these arguments assume that properties of Hawking radiation that are derived from doing QFT on a fixed background. That will be important. Just to give another explanation, um, perhaps more intuitive, we can compare the thermal energy of Hawking radiation with that of a black hole above extremality. Um, if we look at the, look at the mass of a black hole depends on the temperature, we'll see that the energy approaches the extremal value quadratically with the temperature with a slope that is, but not a slope, but with, with a coefficient that is precisely this breakdown scale. And the Hawking temperature is linear. And if we are below this breakdown scale, then the energy of the Hawking quanta is bigger than the energy of the black hole above the 
Now, as a side comment that will be important later, this breakdown scale also appears in the entropy. We compute the Bekenstein-Hawking entropy and expand it at small temperatures. Um, we get this zero temperature entropy, and then we get a correction that is linear in, in, in the temperature and, and comes with a coefficient that is precisely this breakdown scale. So this is another way. You can identify these scales either either from the temperature dependence of the of the mass or the temperature dependence of the of the entropy. So again, we have the same situation as before. So we have a, we take the classical gravity answer by itself. We we have um, a puzzle if we try to force this interpretation of the black hole as a quantum system. And again, we can either give up on interpreting this result from gravity as a black hole in the sky by quantum system, or we can try to look for, for corrections to the graphical analysis. That's what we will do. So um, now I want to explain the, the resolution of these puzzles. Uh, and this is based on work. Well, we, we, we well, Gosh and Maxfield, then we, we look at Eliezu. And Matt that is here, also Wen Shao and other papers that I will mention later. So the idea is that as we approach extremality, for example, if you if you want to compute the, the fixed temperature ensemble, the free energy becomes independent of the fluctuations of a specific mode in the metric that is the length of this throat. So at very low temperatures, the length of this throat can fluctuate and um, without any without any cost. And when we have a mode whose action is small, that, needs, that means that it needs to be quantized. Uh, inside the throat, four dimensional, or the, the way we did it originally was to realize that inside the throat, four dimensional Einstein gravity can be written as a theory on ADS2 after reducing on, on the angular directions with essentially two main sectors. The first one is called Jakita on gravity, and this is made of spherical symmetric modes in the metric. So this includes the fluctuations of the length of the throat that I just mentioned. And then we have to the matter that is essentially all other taken modes from reducing of the sphere coming either from the metric or from any light matter you might have in higher dimensions. Um, the upshot of this analysis is that, uh, and this is a result from well, a lot of people that Especially something that interestingly was uh, started by by studying models of condensed matter, just such as the such the entire model that share interestingly many properties with black holes. But I, I but that would perhaps take too long to go in that direction. Uh, so I'll just give you the directly the, the conclusion. Um, but the important thing of this JT model, this S waves of the metric, is that the Quantum effects are controlled, they were found to be controlled precisely by this ratio of the temperature to this breakdown scale. So essentially, uh, whenever the temperature is small, this the coupling of this mode become large, uh, small compared to what? Well, the same breakdown scale that appeared in the 91 analysis okay, of Presky and Collaborate. And importantly, this theory of 2DJT gravity can be even when coupled to arbitrary matter, can be exactly quantized for any temperature as long as you take the the extremal entropy that appears as a parameter to be large. If the entropy is not large, then we cannot we cannot solve it, but at least to, to leading order, uh, this is enough. <clears throat> well, well, because of the matter. Because of the matter, yes. So if we remove the matter and we consider pure 2 djt gravity, we can solve it, but then that's that doesn't come from any realistic kind right. dimensional um, theory of gravity. Yeah, thanks for the question. So, okay, so we could follow two routes. I could explain precisely what JT gravity is. I assume you maybe heard about it already and how to quantize it. But instead, let me jump to the results and how they address the previous puzzles. And partly the reason why I want to do it this way is that in the last part of the talk, I will describe some upcoming work that reproduces the answer I'm about to show you without relying on any effective description of the throat and without doing any small temperature expansion. Uh, so for that reason, I wanted to mention JT gravity because that's how we, how these these effects were found. But I will I will I will tell you how to derive them later without, in case you're well, 
in case you are bothered by by uh, using two D gravity to say something in higher dimension. We'll have to do it. Okay, so let me give you the answer. So this is the quantum corrected entropy. Um, and these quantum effects appear in a lot of quantities. The, the entropy, the uh, quasi normal modes I might mention in a bit if I have time, but, but this is just like a simpler one to illustrate the effect. Um, and well, this was computed in, in these papers, and recently it was shown that this result also applies for the curve block. So it was originally done for Rice and Northrum. Uh, and it was recently shown to apply also for for the curve black hole in this in these two papers. Um, and as a function of temperature, the entropy has the following form, and um, it depends on on a few parameters. So we have the extremal area, the breakdown scale, the temperature, and also this coefficient n that tells you how many scalar fermions of vectors your theory has in four dimensions that are light. Um, and finally, this is only an approximation of low temperatures. There are corrections that are suppressed either in one over uh, the extremal entropy or, or corrections that become just small if the temperature is, is too low. But okay, I, let me let me unpack this impression for you. Since you thought of, yeah. we only computed the last term. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and there might be, we did, there could be other terms that come in. Super radiance and so on. Yeah, yeah. That we didn't compute. So yeah, I was. Oh, I was we only have that last term. We don't. Yeah, we're yeah. not saying anything about what other terms might be. No. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 I was going to mention that later. Yeah, yeah. Going yeah. steps. We didn't write that full form though. No, this last term. Yeah. yeah. Um, but okay. But, but, um, but let's unpack this expression in case you haven't seen it before. So the first line is just the, the classical bergenstein hawking entropy at small temperatures that I wrote before. So it's the extremal one with this correction that is linear in temperature. Um, <clears throat> and the second line arises from all from quantum corrections which are the ones we're, we're interested in the purpose of this talk. So the first one, this, this term uh, arises from the to the description, it arises from these matter fields that can, can be either KK modes or reduction of, of matter in higher dimensions. Uh, and that's why this, this term that is logarithmic in the extremal entropy depends on the on, on the matter fields, the low energy matter fields. Uh, but maybe I didn't say it, but this 964 comes from the from the KK modes of the metric. There are not very very similar. Oh, there's no gravity up here. No, well, I'm not discussing the super. Uh, okay, so this is a small but but important correction to the extremal entropy that was calculated by by Ashok Sen and, um, in a series of papers starting from 15 years ago. And they're important because in the context of string theory they can be compared to microscopic countings. Um, but his result was not complete. Um, it was missing the, the last term that I will discuss next. Um, so the last term depends on the temperature. It's logarithmic in the temperature divided by this breakdown scale. And it comes in the 2D description only from this JT model that I mentioned. Um, and this was this is a new term that was not considered earlier. Um, this is important because it becomes large and can compete with the classical term precisely when the temperature is of order of the breakdown scale. This is very different than other classical corrections to the extremal limit that might be uh, for example, this ratio square, which will be even more irrelevant as you lower the temperature. This logarithm is important because it means that as you lower the temperature, it becomes more and more dominant. And related to the passes that I mentioned, this is, this is the most interesting one, probably why most people focused on this in the recent years. Okay, so the implications for, of the quantum effects are more clear when we look at the spectrum. Uh, so this is the, the black hole spectrum as a function of the energy, energy being the mass above extremality. So if we go far away from extremality, the, this density of states grows exponentially with the extremal entropy and, and, and with the energy. If we reach, if we lower the temperature, classically, without any quantum effect, the density of states will, will go to a constant that is exponential in the extremal entropy, where this, this energy vanishes. 
Uh, but instead, when we include these quantum effects, the density of states, instead of remaining large, below this breakdown scale, goes to zero, to disorder in the number of approximations. So as we approach externality, this is going to answer what you were saying earlier, we expect the classical reasoning to tell us that the entropy will be, will be large, but we see that it goes to, to zero. So these quantum effects are actually can become, can become large to go close to externality. And again, from the perspective of a quantum system, this is not surprising that you have large quantum effects at low temperatures, they're kind of obvious, but the point is to see that from, from gravity, not to, yeah, to identify the, the mode in gravity responsible for this. That was the, the most unclear aspect of it. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'll mention that. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. I think maybe yeah, the, last, the, the next slide. Um, so what is the li limit of validity of this analysis? Um, to answer this, it's useful to think about classical limit and how it arises from the path integral. Um, so <clears throat> usually if we want to do a path integral in the classical limit, we uh, identify the saddle points, we sum over them, each saddle point will come with a classical action and a quantum correction, and then we pick whatever saddle has the largest or the, the lowest action, right, to be the dominant one. Um, now, the cinema black hole is an exception to this rule because the, the action is indeed very negative, so the action is this, this optimal entropy, but the quantum fluctuations cancel completely the, 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 its contribution because the quantum correction, this logarithmic in temperature term that I showed earlier, in terms of the partition function translates to a, to a power of p to the three halves. Um, so this is a saddle with a very large it would large and negative action, but where the quantum correction completely cancels its contributions or its uh, <clears throat> So also to answer the, uh, your question, to access the ground states of the black hole, black hole requires non-perturbative effects and it's beyond the approximation with which this calculation was, was done. Because once this quantum correction becomes small enough, then when the temperature is exponentially small in the extremal area, then the black hole saddle will compete with any other saddle, and then the calculation goes out of control. <clears throat> so when I talk about this, I mean temperatures much lower than this breakdown scale, but larger than uh, the average gaps of the black hole that are exponentially small. And <clears throat> uh, I didn't write a formula for that lower bound because to write the precise formula, you would need to know exactly the size of these other non-perturbative effects to, to say precisely how how low you can go, but it's expected to be exponentially small in the in the entropy, in the extremal entropy. Okay, so some conclusions is that the extremal black holes do not exist. They are completely destroyed by quantum corrections. If we and by extremal, I don't mean I don't mean near extremal, I mean exactly extremal. If you want to do zero temperature, their contribution just vanishes, and then any other non-perturbative thing will will take over. <clears throat> um so this, in a sense, restores the third law because now it removes this unpleasant large degeneracy. <laughs> the second point is that due to the chaotic nature of the black hole spectrum, uh, indeed we expect gaps between the microstates to be suppressed in, in the entropy, but, but okay, this is not visible from semi-classical gravity, but we also don't expect it to be, so that's, that's okay. Yeah. So regarding the third point, so the, uh, the, the large quantum corrections, so that the uh, 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 thermal partition function is not dominated by the Euclidean black hole setting. Does that necessarily imply that the Lorentzian black hole solution is like not a valid solution? Um, well, I'm focusing in the free energy because that's the simplest, uh, the simplest observable you can compute. But this large mode will also be Lorentzian signature. Um, <clears throat> and I, yeah, I was going to mention it in a slide. Um, although maybe I'll, I'll see, maybe I skip it, but. You can compute, for example, the the, the analog of the quasi normal modes, how perturbation would decay in time. <clears throat> and these quantum corrections also change the way the black hole thermalizes in, in time. So they, they appear in, in observables that uh, involve Lorentzian evolution also. Here I just focus on this, just the simplest possible quantity to compute. That's it. That's it. Um, yes, I think an important conclusion is that any phenomenon that relies on the classical extremal black hole geometry should be reconsidered. Um, I'm not saying that everything has to be 
uh, redone, but at least you have to keep this in mind that this is an effect that might be important depending on, on what you want to compute. And for example, this Presky lateral issue is not really present anymore because now the geometry fluctuates and the derivation of the Cochrane radiation based on QFT on a fixed background is not uh, uh, valid any, any longer. Um, okay, so let me mention. Okay, yeah, yeah. Um, just to mention something that depends on 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 our evolution, some quantum effects also modify the dynamics of the black hole that I just mentioned. Uh, an example are the quasi-normal modes. So the classical dynamics of black holes are dissipative. So if you perturb them, for example, by some probe matter field at a certain time, the perturbation, as measured from an um, outside observer, will, um, well, in principle, will oscillate and at nine times will take this form, where this coefficient depends on the uh, uh, the way you perturb it. But the spectrum of these frequencies omega n, which is called the quasi-normal modes for a black hole, are complex and they have a negative imaginary part. So the fluctuations oscillate and decay um, and decay in time. Um, ignoring some fact, some subtleties about quasi-normal modes in flat space that are not really important for what I would say, the conformal symmetry that emerges near the horizon at low temperature, this area is too broad, fixes, fixes the spectrum of the low lying quasi-normal mode to, to, to take this form, where delta is a parameter that depends on the on the perturbation of mass of this problem. Perfect. Um, so the wave perturbation of decay in time is completely fixed by this by this symmetry. But if we go at low temperatures, then again we need to include back reaction from the metric, and this spectrum of quasi-normal mode is completely changed. And in fact, the perturbations do not even decay exponentially; they decay with a universal power law. <clears throat> and these are really long times; they're times longer than the inverse of this breakdown scale. Um, and this is a conclusion from studying correlation functions of matter fields near the throat, but essentially any other physical phenomenon controlled by these correlation functions, such as Hawking radiation, will also be affected by these quantum corrections uh, in real time. Um, and I didn't write it down because it's kind of an ugly, the, the exact answer is it's much uglier than for the free energy, that's why I focus on the free energy. <laughs> but in, in the context of this SYK model, we derived these correlators in, in this paper a long time ago, and then put it in the context of these near similar black holes here, and this is still an, an active area of, of research. Okay, so before I move on to the upcoming work, let me mention the, the supergravity. Wait, sorry, if we just were to take a, a scalar field on um, which at finite temperature, are you saying if we take a scalar field which at finite temperature might be expected to decay exponentially? It decays like a power law. Yeah, but if you go to very long time, <clears throat> so no matter even in a thermal ensemble. Well, I mean, yeah. so in principle, one could imagine being in this region where you're the one loop effect down, but there's still a, a there's still a, a large number of degrees of freedom, and you still um, you can still do standard thermodynamics. It's just that it's governed by the one loop term rather than the it's dominated by the one loop term rather than the classical terms oh, so in this uh, regime. Right? Yeah, something important of these correlators is that they are not one loop exact anymore like the free energy. So if you wait long enough times, it will be, it's not the one loop regulation that leads to this power law. Uh, this one loop exactness of this correction to the free energy, but this one loop exactness is only for the correction to the free energy. So suppose we, we, we want to take the black hole and we want to put it in equilibrium. We want to define a vacuum state and a, a stationary uh, vacuum state. Mm -hmm. So we would put it at thermal equilibrium at some temperature. Mm -hmm. If we make that temperature very, very low, mm -hmm. then we can be in this regime where the one loop effect dominates. Mm -hmm. That's still a sensible thing to do, yeah. right? Yeah. Wouldn't in that case, the two point functions of the scalar field be exponentially decayed in periodic and imaginary time? Uh, no. No? No. I mean, they're periodic in imaginary time, but it's in Lorentzian time. Uh, well, if they're, 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 if they're periodic in imaginary time, they're thermal. Yes. Well, I, I didn't write the exact answer. The exact answer is periodic in imaginary time. But I'm just saying, if you start with the two-point function in the thermal state, and you take Lorentzian time on a very long Lorentzian time, <coughs> then it will decay as a power law instead of uh, exponential. Right. 
quickly. You're saying you have a, a green function which is periodic and imaginary time, yet has a, exactly, yet has a power law tail. Yeah. I can that's show surprising. it to you. Yeah. <laughs> I, yeah, I can show it to you after the. Okay. <clears throat> All right, Vince. Hello? Can you hear me? This, is, of course, is a state in which it's a thermal state. It's not a pure state. Yeah, yeah, it's a thermal state. Yeah. So when you put in space, it'll be periodically identified. Yeah. yeah. And this power law was also found. The, the way you phrase your question, you could have asked it about any quantum system, not necessarily a, a black hole. And this power law are also found in late time decay of correlators in the SYK model, for example. Um, just to say that it's nothing too um, specific necessarily to black holes. Okay. Um, and since, well, since you asked that, also let me say that there are also power law decays of perturbations in flat space that are classical, and this is unrelated to that. This has a origin in quantum correction, it's not. It's not a classical effect. Okay, so uh, before I yeah before I describe the upcoming work, let me uh, for those of you interested in string theory, mention what happens with with supergravity. So consider in four dimensions n equals two supergravity in an asymptotically flat for the universe. <clears throat> then the extremal limit of black holes preserve uh, some supersymmetry if they are not rotating. Um, one of the successes of string theory has been to reproduce the Bergenstein Hawking entropy and extremality by macrostate counting of, of BPS states uh, out of but so called difference in, in string theory. <clears throat> uh, so they reproduce this formula in the, the classical limit of gravity. But I just told you that the extremal entropy of the black hole doesn't translate into ground state degeneracy. So you could have asked, like, well, it was asked what, so what's going on, uh, how should we interpret these previous results? Um, <clears throat> and the answer, okay, it says that some specific modes of the gravitino, which is now fermions that come with any theory of supergravity, they also become light near extremity and they also need to be exactly quantized, and they interact in a non trivial way with the metric, for example. So uh, now the form of the spectrum can be completely different than where it was before. And <clears throat> this paper, we did this analysis for supergravity, and we found that instead of having this curve that goes to zero at extremity, that I showed earlier, instead, instead it vanishes uh, at the finite energy that we call the, the, the gap scale. And then there is a delta function that is still multiplied by this exponential of the extremal entropy exactly at, at the extremality. <clears throat> um, and we, when we include the quantum effects of the gravity, you know, then that um, uh, allows this extremal black holes to, to survive. But, but it's important to realize that they are not classical. You cannot. Just look at the classical solution and and analyze it. You still have these large quantum corrections, even though the uh, now the black holes are, are indeed there. And this gap scale is precisely the well, this this breakdown scale when you evaluate it for a non-rotating black hole. The gravitino is zero in the background, yeah. right? The solution looks the same. Yeah, so that's important. So the solution looks the same. But since this is a quantum effect, what are the fields that are fluctuating on top of the geometry is, is important. If you have this field or not, it can lead to very different answers. Yeah, yeah the geometry in this case will be near extreme rise and north in, in both cases. Yeah, so that's another illustration that you should that you should be careful on how you interpret the classical extreme geometry. Okay, so the puzzle, the first puzzle is resolved because okay, now we have a large number of gram states, but there is a symmetry principle. Namely, for example, you can compute indices that are invariant under um, that you can compute them in the free limit, and they're in, they're they don't depend on the coupling. So when you go to the black hole regime, you can uh, extrapolate them, and they give you a lower bound on the number of ground states. <clears throat> and the second puzzle, well, the gap removes all the microstates in this problematic region, so you don't even have to to worry about it. And finally, since we are seeing the gap. Uh, the semi classical analysis of gravity that is quite interesting. One can even attempt to extract the Hilbert space of BPS black holes directly from gravity. And this is something you cannot do in the non supersymmetric case because of these large quantum effects. They don't allow you to decouple 
near female black hole from, from the environment. Okay, is there any question before I start with last, last part? Okay. <clears throat> okay, so now I will describe this, this upcoming work with Polanowski, Marov, Rakic, and Rangamani. Uh, so you might have some issues with the derivation I showed so far. Um, for example, it relies on an effective description of the throat. This I already mentioned. We use this two dimensional gravity description of the ADS2 throat, but the black hole is embedded in flat space or could be like the ADS. DS, uh, but embedded in some environment. <clears throat> and the second issue is that this is done in a small temperature expansion around the extremality. It would be nice to have a calculation one could do at finite temperature, that one can later take small temperatures and still reproduce these results, working also in the full geometry. Um, and that's what we are doing. So let me start with the toy model, the BTC black hole. Uh, so we consider 3D gravity with a negative cosmological constant with, with this action, and the BTC solution de describes a massive rotating black hole in this geometry, and this is the metric. Uh, it has a mass m and angular momentum j that will depend on r plus and r minus, so these are parameters of the metric that tells you where the outer and inner horizon are, and it has two potentials, the temperature and angular velocity depend on these two parameters, R plus and R minus. <clears throat> and the extremal limit corresponds to a limit where R minus goes close to R plus, I would just call R naught, and the mass approaches J. So there is a similar extremality bound where the mass has to be bigger than J. And the similar limit is actually, in this limit, the temperature vanishes. This is proportional to the difference between the two, and the angular velocity goes to one, so the black hole is rotating at the speed of light. And near the horizon, the throat becomes ADS2 cross process one, so it's very similar to its higher dimensional counterpart. Um, so what we want to do is to consider fluctuations of the metric of this form. So we take the background, Jimmy knew this is the near optimal BTC asymptotically ADS3. And we want to perturb it by some metric mode HB nu. It's useful to define this H tilde quantity. Um, and we want to compute this one loop determinants around the geometry. Uh, we need to, well, this is the action, so it has a large number of symmetries of the difference, so we need to gauge it. We will do it in harmonic gauge. And when you add the, add the gauge fixing term and expand to quadratic order, you get some action for fluctuations around the BTC geometry, where it depends on HP new, and it has this differential operator that is called the Wignerowicz operator that it takes this. Um, well, this is the form it takes actually in any dimensions. You can write this this expression. And to compute quantum corrections, we need to diagonalize this differential operator. Okay. Um, ghosts or matter fields will not be relevant for our purpose. I mean, one can include them. They just don't lead to any effect that will be important for what I will say. I think you go to more, it's a higher uh, floating medium value. Yeah, one yeah. below that. Below, below. Yeah, okay. Thank you, Flash. Okay. Um, yeah, so we expect the JT modes of the, the goal of this, this part is to identify the JT modes in the full geometry at finite temperature. And we expect them to be physical modes and to be off shell, of course, they are quantum fluctuations. So we look particularly at fluctuations that are transverse, so they, they satisfy our gauge condition and are traceless. Um, and I'm not going to give you the answer because it's a little. Um, Sorry, what, what, what was that? What was what? Yeah. Oh, that, yeah, I'm about to say. So oh. we derive a set of modes that are eigenfunctions of this Minerowitz operator in this gauge, and they are labeled by their Matsubara frequencies. So the the time dependence of the modes is e to the to pi i. Oh, NT over beta. Um, so we have some uh, analytic expression for this HNs mu nu, and their defining property is that they're eigenfunctions of the Wignerowitz operator, 
And their eigenvalue is given by this expression in terms of the left and right moving temperatures that depend on, on the, the radius of the horizon. Um, <clears throat> the modes have some non trivial radial profile, are rotation and symmetric. Um, and let me say that we use them to find them. We use some previous results by that and David and Castro, Peter, and Pitowski. Sorry. <laughs> um, um, something important about this, this model, about this eigenvalues that you see if you go yeah. at the three mile limit, then this left moving temperature is, is small. Then this is, this, this is negligible this term and so here you can replace it by one and here you have an overall factor of tl which means that these are modes whose eigenvalues vanish as you lower the temperature okay um and the comment that will be important in a minute this is our gauge condition and we're also choosing them to be traceless and this is because we want to remove the well in any Gravity calculation, there is a negative mode that was identified a long time ago by Gibbons, Hawking, and Perry. And this is in the, uh, this comes from fluctuations of the trace. Uh, the trace also decouples from the rest of the modes in the metric, so we can just uh, forget about that. But, but this will be important in a minute for rest of Okay, so instead of writing some long formula, let me show you a plot of the field. So is this more than the mode on the on the full rotation? Yeah, yeah, in the, in the full rotation. <clears throat> so let me show you the profile of the modes uh, instead of writing some low formula for uh, n equals three. So this is the norm of the modes, and uh, this is as a function of the proper distance from the horizon. And uh, as we approach extremality, we go from the purple to the red curve. As we lower the temperature, and we see that as we as we lower the temperature, the modes become more and more concentrated near the horizon of the black hole as expected. And the profile you can check it matches the profile of these JT modes that that I mentioned earlier. So this is what I mean before. You can now derive what I result that I showed without even talking about this uh, three-dimensional gravity. Uh, so another thing is that at fixed, if you look at the fixed distance, so the modes start going into the horizon. But if you look at the fixed distance and extend temperature to zero, the modes we found will vanish. So you can ask, does it mean these modes disappear at extremality? How should we interpret it? And the answer is no. So we can compute some coordinate invariant quantity, which is the proper length of the throat. So it's the proper distance from any point to the, to the horizon. And these modes affect this proper length. And if we take the zero temperature limit, the fluctuation in the length remains finite. So I think maybe one way to think about these modes is- uh, how, how, how exactly do you decide where the throat begins and ends? Um, yeah, it, it ends at the horizon and it starts at uh, any point outside of the horizon. And uh, the answer is to link all the independence of the, what point you choose as the, but you have to oh, decide how you hold that point outside the horizon fixed as you go to extremality, right? Uh, yeah, actually, in the calculation, it's a little simpler because the length, even from the uh, boundary of ADS3 to the horizon, well, that's obviously divergent. Yeah. But um, if you to leading order compute it with the correction of this H menu, uh, that's finite even if you integrate all the way to the boundary. And, uh, but that's yeah. how we did the calculation. If if it wouldn't have been finite, then I would have been I would be forced to be more careful about that the point. But yeah, so this is just to say that this matches with also the intuition I mentioned earlier that we have these fluctuations of the length of the throat and, and these are the responsible for this point of the Okay, so to conclude, we verify that the existence of a single family of modes which at low temperature satisfy the same property of these JT modes, so they're eigenfunctions that well, in harmonic gauge, that's just a choice, of course, we could find it in the other gauge, but there are eigenfunctions with eigenvalues that vanish linearly with the temperature. At lower temperature, they become more and more concentrated in the throat. Uh, since lambda is proportional to T, they are very light and lead to large quantum corrections. And finally, uh, be, but if you compute their contributions to the free energy, for example, um, they lead to the same logarithmic corrections that I described earlier. I'm not going to do that calculation, but how do you? There's a gap in it, is there? 
What do you mean by saying that value? Uh, yeah, the eigen the eigen value is vanishing up to the temperature of the I guess you would say there is no gap for this one. Oh, there is no gap because yeah. of <clears throat> yeah, that's the, that's the yeah. I guess that's the whole non-trivial right. feature yeah, that these yeah, modes yeah. have. That yeah. uh, okay. So in the last minutes, let me describe Rice and Northrum. Um, so we consider this this action of um, Einstein coupled to the Maxwell field. We added a small negative cosmological constant. This is not too important. It's just to regulate some problems that appear in in flat space that are not really related to the physical problem we are trying to study. <clears throat> um, but I can comment on that later. So the rise and solution in ADS is given by this expression. It depends on the, on the mass and the charge, cosmological constant, and this is the, the Maxwell field, the solution. So, well, we did the same. We expand the metric around this background. We expand the gauge field around this background. And we expect roughly three sets of, uh, and I say roughly because it's just the intuition from the 2D analysis. We expect three sets of uh, gapless mode. Um, one that comes from the JT mode from S waves that is kind of fluctuation on the throat, length of the throat. We expect some uh, U1 gauge modes that arise from charge fluctuations. And we also expect some SO3 modes that come from fluctuations of the angular momentum of the black hole. And to find them, you would just derive the quadratic operator of the Einstein Maxwell action that we call delta EM, they have analyzed it and identify the long low lying, lowest lying modes. Are you fixed yes. potential for these various global symmetries or fixed charge? Uh, yeah, so uh, since we are in, in higher dimensional, higher than two dimensional, we are, we are we are fixing the chemical potentials. Okay. Right. <clears throat> right. Which is the more natural, more, more natural boundary condition. <laughs> okay, so in principle, we could do this. Of course, it's easier to say than, than to do it, and there are a lot of technical issues, some of which we we solve. Uh, so let me mention some of them. Um, first, the Maxwell field is turned on in the background, so this is maybe obvious. The graviton and the photon fluctuations will couple, so we need to, we cannot study the metric independently of the Maxwell field. The second problem is that the negative mode of the Einstein action, which before we could just get rid of by imposing tracelessness of the metric fluctuations, uh, is now coupled to, to the photon as well. And it's not that as easy to identify as, as before. And another more technical problem is that if we would do the naive thing of taking a combination of harmonic gauge and Lorentz gauge, this is inconsistent with, with the, and try to find eigenmodes, it's inconsistent with, with the precise form of this quadratic operator and well this is hard to say in words but the reason is that the dimorphism act both on the Maxwell field and the metric so picking a gauge condition that treats the two independently it's unnatural let me show you what, what we did to fix some of this so we follow the recent proposal by Marl and Santos and, and Liu <clears throat> and they did it for pure gravity and we extended it for for um uh, for Einstein Maxwell so the first one is <clears throat> uh, that solves the first two problems is that we write this quadratic kernel delta em with respect to the following inner product. So we find this inner product between fluctuations h and a. Uh, this inner product is uh, it's not degenerate, but it's not positive. So some modes can have negative uh, inner products, some have positive. Um, and the advantage of this inner product that it changes the form of the of this quadratic kernel a bit is that now the spectrum of, of delta is is positive. And the negative modes of the actions are the ones are the modes that have a negative inner product, but this doesn't affect the determination of the eigenvalues. Okay. <clears throat> um, so the idea is that you take this inner product, you write the, the the differential operator with respect to this inner product, you analyze it, you find the, all the positive eigenvalues, and then the modes that have negative norm, you we rotate. Yeah. So you're looking at this in all kinds of different gauges. Yeah. And but usually um, um, invariance of the theory under di different choices of gauge mm -hmm. de depends uh, strongly on the fact that 
uh, ghost contributions uh, cancel out the effects of changing the date. But you're not including ghosts here, right? Yeah, because uh, that's part of what the gauge choice that we will do helps with the mods that we. The way this helps is that it will make the mods we are looking for be uh, physical and satisfy the gauge conditions. And this ghost sector becomes orthogonal to, to the mods that I'm discussing. But so, could, could, they, could there be a ghost contribution to the term? There is, there is. The, I mentioned that. Oh, there so you're going you're gonna to include the ghost. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm just. Oh, I, I, thought, I, thought you were, yeah. I, I thought you were saying you did. No, 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 no. We, we did, but uh, if you try to diagonalize the kinetic operator of the ghost, those are gaps. So they don't lead to any large effect at low temperatures. That's, you can see it very clearly in the BBC case. So they, they contribute to this, for example, this logarithmic correction that depends on well, the area. We're not of the BTZ here. And BTZ is kind of soluble, right? So yeah, this looks like a much, much harder problem. Yeah, yeah, but, but the, the ghost is easier than what we are doing. So, okay. because, so the, yeah, you can also check it for the ghost. Okay. Yeah. But why would the ghost be gap, yeah, but not the, is it the, is it the metric ghost basically the same equation as the Maxwell field? It's just well, not because there are also terms that depend on the on the uh, curvature. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so that that does that, that is important. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. For okay. Yeah, in the previous paper that that about the curve black hole, we pointed out some problem with rotational modes that. Um, well, okay, maybe I can say that later because we maybe technical. But they lead to problems sometimes, but it's a problem about the choice of gauge, not the problem with. Those being physical for these effects. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> I, I can tell you that later. Uh, yeah, so if you write the, the well, just to recap, if you write the quadratic operator delta with respect to this inner product, the eigenvalues are positive, some modes have negative norm, you will rotate them. Um, um, and that's the way we, we dealt with the first two problems in the previous slide, because now, uh, just diagonalize this operator and look for the lowest line modes, and those will be the uh, these changing modes that we are after. Um, so, and finally, well, a small thing it's important to take the fluctuation of the Maxwell field to be imaginary, and that's because uh, in Euclidean signature, a real charge implies that the gauge connection is imaginary. So, to, to make the operator self adjoint and even diagonalizable, it's important, it's, it's important to take this. This contour. Um, finally, the choice of gauge that deals with this uh, last problem of the previous slide that was proposed also in the uh, Maro Santos papers is that you should define a gauge condition such that all pure gauge fluctuations are orthogonal to any configuration that satisfies that gauge condition. Okay, so this is a can be written in in the form of a, an equation and read off what the precise form of the gauge condition satisfying this would be. And we obtain this expression. So this is the gauge in which we work. So we pick Lorentz gauge for the Maxwell field, but instead of harmonic gauge, the gauge for the metric fluctuations couples to the photon. And this is related to the fact that I said that the formorphism affect both metric and the Maxwell. Um, and this solved this technical problem that we were having before. Should I recognize the second combination is like the hunting rock? Term or is it an S dot A? Ooh, uh, a no, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Yeah, I guess it's probably more than okay, it has to be a vector made up of A and F, so maybe that's <laughs> only thing that's wrong. Uh, there's a question in the chat from Alex Utsaka. According to this result, uh, it's from a couple of minutes ago, that extremal black holes cannot exist. How close to extremality can the spin of a supermassive curve black hole actually get? Uh, yeah, I guess you can read that off from the what I told you that the temperature has to be the roughly what you expect for a Hawking one with that mass, but suppressed by a power of the entropy. So uh, I expect that something like A over M would probably be also like 10 to the minus 8. Yeah. <laughs> probably something that is ridiculous enough that you wouldn't expect. <laughs> To but we always, we always knew that extremal black holes can't 
you know, and then he said extreme old black holes can exist because they're unstable due to super radiance, right? Yeah, yeah, that's also another, yeah, yeah, yeah. And yeah, so that's, yeah, that's not the perspective I want to take, but yeah, if you want to uh, make a connection with observations that then you have to deal with, yeah. with, with those, with those features. Okay. Um, Yes, let me show you just some results. So, of course, these operators cannot be diagonalized uh, by hand, so we need to do it numerically. Um, and, and this is some great work that, that Maciek Kodanowski did. <coughs> uh, he basically discretized the eigenvalue equation and, and solved it numerically. Um, here I'm showing the results. So, if we uh, fix the match bar frequency and look at the lowest line modes, here I'm showing the, how the eigenvalue behaves at low temperatures. So this is, sorry, this is kappa, this is surface gravity, this is proportional to the temperature. Um, so the lowest line eigenvalue um, has this form for n equals two. So we see that that the lowest line eigenvalue indeed goes to zero linearly um, as the temperature is lower. Uh, here I'm showing you the same plot, but in a larger range of temperatures. So you see that at some point the curve deviates from being linear. <laughs> so we can follow these modes all the way away from extremality. Um, and, and this one shows that if you rescale the eigenvalues by n, then all the modes are on top of each other, which means that the eigenvalue is also proportional to n. And this is just important, this is a technical point, but the, the 2D analysis predicts that this is how the, the eigenvalue should behave. And, and, and well, these modes are rotational invariant. And we find another rotational invariant modes that are the U1. Uh, they have the same property again. The low temperatures they vanish linearly, and we can follow them at finite temperature, and they're all proportional to the to n. Um, since, since you wrote the, the horizontal axis with L ADS, and you yeah. had in mind that you wanted to do asymptotically flat, but you turned on the cosmological constant to regulate it. Well, I said we can. This this is oh. far away from the. Uh, the yeah, I didn't take the first space into this. Right, right, right. I was wondering if they were going to bunch up. Or uh, I, I will mention. And then we can also um, consider fluctuations that are not spherically symmetric, that have some some spin, let's say, in the metric, and those ones correspond to the rotational modes that, that, again, they behave precisely the way that you would expect from this earlier um, analysis in the flow. So the profile of these modes are concentrated near the horizon at low temperatures. Um, this, I'm not showing it to you, but you can plot them and, and see that the curves is essentially the same as what I showed you from, from BTC. <coughs> and, uh, and the presence of all these nearly zero modes at low temperature implies a contribution to the free energy that is again logarithmic in the temperature. Uh, finally, just a comment in a grand canonical ensemble very related to what you're asking. Uh, this, would, this might imply that we have several sources of these log corrections coming from the JT modes, from the U1 modes, the rotational modes. So you could think that there are too many contributions, but one can argue that if you change ensemble and go to fixed charge ensemble, all of them disappear except this JT ones that lead to the three-cup block fit. And so all this reproduces the result we presented earlier, but in the full geometry, finite temperature, and without any effective description of the two. In regards to the last part on the grand canonical, do you, do you look at the them over these winding saddles or yeah that's what i mean yeah okay. and that yeah yeah but a lot of temperatures that's uh, easy to incorporate but if you have more windings you might worry that that sum diverges or something well that's a yeah, that's a different yeah. for, the, for the first point so if you take like the low temperature and the near horizon do these modes limit into the working modes okay? yeah 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 we're going to check yeah, I didn't mention that because I didn't write explicitly what they were, but but yeah, we we'll, we'll, we'll verify it. Yeah, but even regardless of the precise form, because the precise form also depends on the your choice of gauge, for example. Otherwise, uh, there is you cannot determine them unambiguously. Uh, but the more maybe gauge invariant defining property of these modes is the fact that their eigenvalues goes to zero at zero temperature. I think that's the that's the most interesting property they have. 
Yeah, yeah, this was the. Um, okay, let me skip the the space limit unless there is any question. So we identify and characterize large quantum corrections uh, that arise plus proximality. We reveal their derivation using the effective description of the throat, throat, but also the full geometry. And one can ask that there are other physical processes involving extreme black holes that should be revisited. For example, well, instabilities should be important to, to incorporate in this analysis. And finally, in the context of ADCFT, one can also ask what does this improved analysis of Thermodynamics of near-extreme black hole teaches about the holographic field theories. Can they have this behavior? I guess we expect them not because we also sometimes it's conjectured that near-extreme black holes are always unstable. But I think before even attempted to answer that question, it's important to know what prediction gravity would make if they were not. So I'll leave that as some of the question and thank you for your attention. And we can ask about the first paper. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, yeah, so we can take the, the limit in which the length of the ADS radius goes to infinity or lambda goes to zero and, and see what happens. And well, the, the only thing that I thought I would have time to mention was that for the Schwarz, for the JT modes and the, these rotational modes, there is nothing funny. The eigenvalues uh, are finite. It just changes the coefficient of the linear and T behavior, but nothing has happened. But the coefficient of the U1 modes uh, blow up. So it, this indicates that the, these U1 modes are not present in the flash phase limit. Um, and we propose a rule to identify this phenomenon. I think one could even probably prove it, but we didn't do it. Which the modes that are problematic in any near extrema limit are the modes whose zero temperature susceptibility or compressibility diverges. So if you have a mode that at the extremality from the classical analysis, the QDB is infinite, then those modes will, will lead to problems. And that's the case for the U1 modes, because for the extremal black hole in flat space, the chemical potential is in appropriate units is one, it's independent of the charge. So in general, the chemical potential is Q over R plus. In the extremal limit, R plus is Q, and the mu is independent of Q. So this, this um, susceptibility is singular. So we, ver we verified in a few cases that, that whenever the, the singularity is present, the eigenvalues uh, blow up and, and the modes are not, are not present. Um, so yeah, perhaps this was the main feature we found in the flash space limit that was not there at the finite eight years per year. I think everyone's hungry. So let's thank Cooking again or we'll okay. go for lunch. Thank you. <laughs>